there, and welcome to another edition of History in Your Own Backyard. I'm Chrissy Morgan, and today we are in Fort Recovery, Ohio, at the Morvelius Opera House with Karen Myring and Carol Judy. Hello there. So tell me, the Opera House was built in Fort Recovery. When was Fort Recovery founded, and what was it like back then? Uh, it was actually platted and founded and incorporated in 1858. Prior to that, there were a couple of Indian battles back in the 1790s that took place here on the grounds, and the fort was built in 93 with an Indian battle in 94, but actually the village itself didn't occur until 1858. Oh, interesting. And the Opera House was built in 1883. Why would an Opera House be built in such a small rural town like Fort Recovery? Uh, many of the Opera Houses are in small rural towns. It was a post-Civil War phenomenon. Um, they wanted to forget about the war. They wanted to get back to normal lives. And uh, they did want to, at that time, bring culture to some of these new growing cities. And almost all of them were on second floors. Oh, interesting. And who first owned the Opera House? And how did it become known as the Morvelius Opera House? I'll take the first part and I'll give you the second part. <laughs> okay. Um, the first, or you take the first part. Okay, it was built in 1883. Ida Schneider and her husband Peter decided to bring the culture into town. Uh, they built the building and the Opera House Saloon was on the ground floor <laughs> and Dr. Adams had his office building and pharmacy on the other side. There were two businesses down there. So we had doctor and saloon and Opera House up on top. Interesting. You can go ahead and talk about the Morvelius. She actually lives in the Morvelius home. Oh, interesting. Yeah, right now. Okay. So she has I'm, become I'm, our expert. I'm very lucky. <laughs> I guess um, so. The Morvelius family. <laughs> Russell Morvelius came to town from St. Mary's and was running a dry goods store. And he and Minnie had a daughter, Faye, who was showing a lot of musical inclination. And I have a feeling Russell kind of liked the idea of the music and the theater part of it. So in 1898, he bought the opera house for his daughter's birthday and it became the Morvelius Opera House and he operated it for many, many years as the manager bringing in the acts and that type of thing until his death. Interesting. And what would you say makes the Morvelius Opera House so special? For one thing, he kept an extensive scrapbook of all the programs and things that happened Lovely. here. So a lot of opera houses just have to maybe guess who was there, or they may have signatures on the back that let them know what group was here in what year. But we could almost do a chronological um, documentation mm -hmm. of, of what has gone on here. So that's really been helpful, and we have the original programs as well. And he was very active. I think it was somewhat active before that, but we think that it was really a passion of his he was a businessman, but I think he loved the arts, and so he wanted to, to make it uh, very um, entertaining for the, for the community, and so it was quite active. Yeah, I guess and so. And daughter Faye did go on to become a trained opera singer and okay. traveled all over the world and spent time out in California and Oregon performing and was very well known back in the day. We just don't have a lot of recordings of her because it was so early in the history mm -hmm. of music. So, uh, right. but she was very famous and when she would come back, she would perform here also. Oh, of course, of course. And many types of scenery are obviously used to make plays. What did they use for scenery? I see um, some of these panels here. We can get a, a bit of an idea. A lot of them have rotted from, from uh, the weather and the sunlight coming in and that sort of thing. But there are uh, slats up here so that they could be pushed in and out. And there were little metal rollers on the bottom of these so they could pull them out. And there's a room for about 10 scenes. So there's a combination of indoor, outdoor, uh, street scenes. Um, I think there's even a prison or a castle scene here. So hopefully they would think that, you know, it would jive up with what comes in, but um, pretty just basic, 10 different basic sets. And there are six pieces, so it created a diorama effect when they were pulled out, so it gave us a feeling of depth on the stage. Also created some wing space for the actors to uh, be shielded from the audience. Interesting. So you had mentioned before that Faye Morvelius had probably performed here. Was the opera house actually used for opera? Probably not. I'm assuming that there were 
operatic and classical selections that were performed. That was kind of the taste that people had at that time anyway. And Faye being a trained opera singer probably sang operatic arias, but the probability of them having a, a full opera was probably not in, in the cards. They may have done an operetta or two. I imagine the building had other uses as well. Yes. Um, they actually did um, meetings up here, literary clubs, um, chime in, Carol, anytime here, I'm drawing a blank, <laughs> circuses, boxing matches, oh, wow. Farmers uh, Institute. The high school used it for their graduations and their high school class plays until 1931 when they built a new gym. Then when they had the gym and the capability, they moved all their things to the school. But until that, they had graduations and everything here. Um, uh, the Farmers Institute was here, uh, which was a learning process for all the farmers in the area. So it was a wide range of things. Right. And some of the entertainers that came in were hypnotists and um, contortionists. contortionists, jig dancers, um, right. comedy sketch groups and things like that. So it was a pretty wide variety. And basically, um, people stopped coming when the silent movies came out. <laughs> so people wanted to go see a movie that had no sound instead of seeing live performers here with this great acoustics. Of course. Kind of silly, but yeah, here it's we the are. way things work <laughs> in history. <laughs> so the Morvillius family had some special talent. Do you feel more that Russell Morvillius had purchased the Opera House specifically to cater to that? I think that was a big part of it. Um, and he was also a big community-minded person. So I think he wanted to continue and provide entertainment. Might bring him a few extra customers to his store across the street, you know, mm. in the long run. But he, I think he was very community-minded and wanted to, like I said, I think he might have had a passion for the arts and wanted to provide it to the community. Yes, yeah. because his business was across the street, that kitty corner that way. So taking on another building was quite a you know, a venture for him to do that. Plus, um, when these companies came to town, they would negotiate with the town or whoever owned the building uh, for so many nights here. They would have a different play every night and they would charge anywhere from 10 to 30 cents per person to get in, which was, that was a pretty good amount of money actually <laughs> at that time. So it was a money-making venture for him too. It was a good thing for him to have um, that extra second income. But again, um, he, I think he just loved the arts, and, and he really did love Fort Recovery. He certainly need people like that. <laughs> yes, we do. So the Opera House, though, wasn't used extensively after 1930. What do you think happened? The Depression, uh, the advent of the silent movies, automobiles were becoming more popular. People could drive further to find mm -hmm. entertainment instead of staying right in town. All of those things played a part, plus the fact that there used to be the Chautauquas and the Lyceum traveling troops that came around here. And in 1900, there were like 400 of those troops traveling through the state and through the country. By 1920, there were only 50. Oh, wow. So those traveling troops were dwindling. It was harder to get entertainment to come in here. So it all played a role. Yep. It's kind of a cycle, you know, if they, if they don't have the places. Plus, this was built in 1883. So by the 30s, you know, it was 50 years old. They actually wallpapered it a couple times. They put burlap on the walls uh, underneath uh, and then wallpaper on the top. They wallpapered the ceiling two times, which is crazy. I can't even imagine doing that. I've wallpapered a ceiling once. I'll <laughs> never do it again. It's, it's just almost impossible. So and modernization, you know, was hitting. We had the industrial age coming at the turn of the century and everything, and no one wanted old fashioned form of entertainment and opera house and the movie theater used to be just across the street hmm. so um, it was just kind of a the way history progresses and um, they fell out of vogue but yeah fell out of vogue so so what was the building used for when it wasn't used for entertainment then the two businesses in the bottom continued and they changed regularly there were dress shops uh, there there weren't any more saloons that I'm aware of in our building that was down the street um, five and dime. Five and dime stores. Um, hardware store was a big one. Two different hardware stores were in here, and at that, and they took over the entire building instead of having two separate businesses. And then in 1979, Mr. Brockman, who ran the funeral home and the furniture store, bought the building, and his sons ran an appliance store. So that was the last business that was in here when Mike, the son, was ready to retire. 
the Opera House Committee decided it was now or never to get this restored because mm -hmm. Mr. Brockman and all the people before him that owned the building always said, the Opera House belongs to town. Yes. Don't mess with it. So it wasn't turned into apartments. It wasn't turned into another store. It wasn't destroyed or damaged. It had the ravages of time, but it survived. So we have it to repair and renew. So tell me, Karen, how did you get involved as part of the process of restoring the Opera House? Well, I was always interested in this place because when I was teaching, I used to bring sixth graders up here on a tour, and it was part of our Broadway staging kind of thing, so we'd let them see a little bit of history and also a little bit of uh, theatrical, what, a, what an old theater would look like. And then three years ago, it'll be three years this July, I believe, uh, a group of people got together and decided to uh, purchase the building. And I think I was invited to the meeting as an afterthought because I was a theatrical person, and then um, I just kind of stayed with the committee then. It was mostly women at the time. Mm -hmm. Carol, did you come I, in right away? I, I came in a little bit later. I thought, well, you came in in July and I was the following March. Um, I had heard that this group was doing this and that it was a larger group and they were getting their 501c3 and they were going through all these steps and I've always loved history and I love the history of Fort Recovery. I'm a transplant to Fort Recovery. I didn't grow up here. Um, but I've always loved the history of Fort Recovery and I'm proud of this little town that I call home now. And I just wanted to help because I love history. And, and what has your group been able to accomplish so far? Well, like Carol said, we got a 501c3. Mm -hmm. We've uh, gotten some grants um, from the state uh, government um, and through the county. A lot of fundraising. A lot of fundraising. And we are also, the building is now on the historic register, which is a big step and uh, took a lot, but we got that done. Um, we've done a lot of demo throughout the building. Uh, we took all the wallpaper off. We've repaired the ceiling. Um, we're repairing the cracks in the wall. Um, we're looking for the new fire door soon. Um, and new windows. New windows. <laughs> one are, of the glass are panes are getting already. pretty top, close to the top of the list <laughs> yes, for those we new are. windows to help insulate and protect as well as sound protect oh, because sure. of mm -hmm. the trucks and tractors that go through here right on the highway. Um, it gets kind of noisy well, up here It's an issue in the horse so. and buggy day. Plus yeah. we're looking at doing a, an annex, we call it, on the back of the opera house, which will give us restrooms and a safer staircase, a little bit of uh, extra area, restroom. And, and, and most importantly, the elevator, elevator for the ADA accessibility. Yeah. Of course. And you know, we're, we have the architecture plans for that. We're dealing with an architect that makes us real, I think, when you know, we're dealing with a company that's gonna help us get through the entire process. The logistics of everything, and, uh, yeah and that will get our annex built. And that's coming up fairly soon also. So we're, we're, we are moving, we're making steps. That is wonderful, literally a ground up process. What are the long range plans for the Opera House? Oh, I, um, that's kind of my area because right away I can see the potential for this building uh, is to open it and have um, monthly um, evening kind of gatherings where you could sell tickets, people could come up, the wine and cheese, music, that sort of thing. But lots of other things like anniversaries and um, um, weddings, showers, weddings, showers, reunions, um, maybe art classes, yoga classes, um, art youth, exhibits. Some youth, some youth drama, youth, youth yeah. acting, youth, youth plays, that, that type of thing. Yeah. Even just like the library does their reading hour, just tell stories to the kids, you know, just get the youth involved and get them up here is, is a big thing also. One of my favorite things that I really want to do, and I'm hoping by fall we maybe could do it, is silent movie night. Oh my goodness. And um, I have some friends who play and we would need to pick out music. They used to have complete scores for these silent movies and you right. can still buy them. Um, they have the, the music for that. So we'd have a piano player. My, my great grandmother used to play piano up here. So I thought that was, would be a really cool thing wow. to show the Phantom of the Opera, the silent version, you know, <laughs> and just silent movies. And it's funny how the history would, you know, that used to be, and then they progressed through doing more modern things. And now we're going to go back and right do back the old way. stuff again. Yes. So it's going right. to swing that pendulum really back. Really a full circle moment. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. So eventually there will be a, a, a big screen drop down here. So there'll be some modernization that goes on with the stage. So you can actually make this a usable place. So there's a lot of potential for what you see in the future of the Opera House. What's the next step for restoring? 
probably the, the windows, the doors that we just talked about, getting the annex built, which will be a building behind this that will attach to it so that all of the non-historical things can be over there, the elevator, the steps, the restrooms, so we don't hurt the history of this building and keep it as historically correct as we can for the National Register. So I think they're talking possibly late fall for the groundbreaking on the annex, and that will be monumental when, we, when people see that start to happen. That's amazing. I have just one other question. How do you preserve some of the stencils? Are there pictures or photos or things from books? We took lots of pictures when we first started and as we tore the wallpaper off we got the pictures of, of everything so that the artist and the painters could recreate those stencils. So the ceiling stencils are exactly like they were in 1883 and the or mural, whenever they were originally painted. And the murals that are on the wall nobody knew about until you took the wallpaper off? Well the wallpaper was falling off already when we came up. So you could, okay. I mean, 20 years ago when I was bringing kids up here, you could see the, the stuff on the wall. So there was just remnants of wallpaper. So I'm not really sure. I don't think anyone actually took it off. It probably just dried up. It used to be wallpaper was just paper. Yeah. Now it's kind of got vinyl in it and whatever. And I think the paper just dried out and, and, um, and But you didn't know off. some of these paintings of the people were there. And... No, no, I actually took the wallpaper off of the faces of the people on the one over there wow. and that was an exciting exciting to day peel it to off and see a face yeah, to there. see her face there I, I was up here one evening working on the wallpaper that was up on those stencils there and one of the other ladies was working up here on the proscenium where we have an empty space right now but William Shakespeare appeared up there when we got the wallpaper off and that was an exciting moment yeah. so William Shakespeare will be going back up there at some point and we, and we got the video of that. Yeah, we looked at it. Someone had hand painted Shakespeare um, mm -hmm. up there in the center. So, in between those two shields up there, that's where that will go. We'll, we'll try to reproduce that up there, get an artist to do that. Unfortunately, that had to go because that was damaged plaster right. wise. It needed to be redone. Well, it's amazing the, all of the work that, that both of you ladies and your community is doing t for this opera house. And we have a great community and we have a great committee of people working on this It's been building. tried a couple of times before and it just was overwhelming because when you would walk in and see all the, the water damage and uh, everything and you know the fact that there's no electricity up here um, plumbing all that kind of stuff it just overwhelmed people at the time and they would talk about it for a while and then it would just oh, okay somebody else has to do it so it was kind of now or never when the building sold we were afraid someone else would buy it and then you would have no control over what would happen up here. Right. If we were going to save it and preserve it, it had to be that done had to the be right the way every yep. every step. Yep. Well, I hope we can come and visit again and oh. and see your progression as the as it goes by. We'd love to have you back. Yes, we love showing her off, don't we? We do. We do. <laughs> we will get out of bed with messy hair and come up here because I've done that before, <laughs> um, just to show it to some people. And I have a branch of the Morvillius family coming on Monday. The ladies coming from Lincoln, Nebraska. So she'll be up here on Monday afternoon. So it's, we, we do love to show her off. The history never goes away. It's no, always with no. us. And we've gotten some artifacts from these people who remember Faye mm -hmm. and that she had given them in, in her advanced age when they were real young, a clock. Uh huh. Uh, we don't have that yet, but no. we'd love to have it <laughs> if they're listening. We, we have a couple of paintings, we paintings and we have some pictures and things like that that, flyers. that people have given us that were phase. Which is amazing so. because this one family from New Mexico found it in a trunk and she was a distant cousin. Faye would have been a distant cousin, so it would have been kind of unusual because they would look at something and go, well, I don't know who that is, and they would have tossed it, but they didn't. And so mm -hmm. I just received a new flyer of a uh, picture of Faye in an ermine collared robe. It was really, really neat. So, of course. So the downstairs, <laughs> part of the downstairs is going to be our, the way of accessing to get into the annex to come up here. So it's going to be a, a bit of a, what we call the gallery. It'll display a lot of things of our downtown history. Because as Carol said, the Native American and the battles and things has been pretty extensively written about in many, many books but not the actual history of the downtown and the businesses. So we kind of want to incorporate that too. Yeah, and we're trying to that move history. that history forward a hundred years sure. and, and get it as well known as our battles finally have become. Because you don't read about those battles in the, the Ohio or history books very much at all because the first one was a defeat. 
<laughs> so we George don't talk Washington about the American pleased. defeats. <laughs> right. um, so, you know, some of the people that were with the Historical Society that are now on our committee work very, very hard to get the battles more well known. So now we're moving on into the 18th and 19th century and getting that story told. And I'm certain once the Opera House is fully finished, you're going to hear more stories oh, yeah. about mm -hmm. what, what the community was like back mm -hmm. then. That's amazing. Thank you so much for your time, ladies. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank, Thank you, you for watching another episode of History in Your Own Backyard. Today I was with Carol Judy and Karen Myring. I'm Chrissy Morgan. We were in Fort Recovery, Ohio at the Morvelius Opera House. Remember, travel slowly and stop often. Mm -hmm.